Let me know when you're ready to go. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well here we are in Cecil B. DeMille's original office from 1913 and 14 when the young wannabe director first came out to Los Angeles and in, in particular Hollywood, California. Uh, the room has been largely recreated from photographs like this one uh, to the way that it would have originally looked. However, we do have some very wonderful original artifacts in the room. We have these two pair of shoes and these leather leggings, which he was quite well known for wearing. You see him wearing them in this photograph. Oh, yes, he yes. called them his putties, uh, which... Oh, I didn't know that you were the one who brought them. They are from DeMille's estate. Oh, wow. Right, okay. So these are all, uh, the, these are all DeMille's. Uh, wonderful photograph here of DeMille and Lasky, and then later, um, uh, later executives from Paramount uh, with an exhibition of very early cameras and some wonderful early photographs yeah. uh, of the Jesse Lasky Feature Play Corporation which was soon to become Paramount Pictures. Um, we, you can see by these shoes, uh, these shoes are, um, are called gaiters. This is what they were called at the time, these high-topped shoes. Right. And very, very popular into the very early 1920s. So we know that these would have been really World War I era shoes. The brown um, brogans probably a bit later. But, uh, but these are the putties, as you can see, that are being worn in this mm. photograph. We also have this fedora hat. We don't have the photograph in, uh, in this room, but we do have in our archives a photograph of DeMille wearing this hat in 1918. So we know that this hat goes at least clean. as far back as 1918. Uh, we have a couple of his date planning books. Um, from roughly the 1920s wow. of appointments he was to be keeping, as you can see here. Anyway, uh, this typewriter, Stella Stray. Stella Stray, who was the secretary to Mr. DeMille, this is her typewriter, which she used to type the original script of the original Squaw Man in 1913. Uh, the story goes, how true it is, we don't know. Uh, Mr. DeMille was a great storyteller, some of it was true, some of it wasn't, uh, that he had received uh, word from the New York office, uh, Sam Goldwyn, at this time his name was Sam Goldfish, was left back in New York to try to raise money, and he was desperate to, to cut down expenses, cut down expenses. Nothing changes in the film industry. We still get the same calls all the time. You know, get rid of everything that isn't necessary. One of the things that the New York office considered to be unnecessary was Mr. DeMille's secretary, Stella Stray. And so when, uh, when, when DeMille got the word, he had to let Stella go. And she started packing up her belongings, including this typewriter. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. wait a minute. Where, where do you think you're going with the typewriter? She said, well, it's my typewriter. I brought it in. When they looked into the cost of renting a typewriter weekly, it was only a dollar or so different uh, per week than they were paying her to be the secretary and bring in her own typewriter. Stella stayed. Stella stayed for the rest of his life and even was his secretary at the time that he died. And after he died in his own, in his own home office, she would bring a fresh flower every day and turn over the, um, the date book on the calendar. Wow. I guess just in case he came back. Um, in the case behind you, you will see some other uh, accoutrements. The general public doesn't get to see these usually, but um, we're special. This is DeMille's writing crop, which he used very often. Right. Of course, this Full is the, the whole American director, silent movie director uh, image comes from people trying to imitate... Um, and emulate uh, uh, Mr. DeMille, who rode, who would wear, as you can see in that photograph over there, his putties, his jodhpurs, and his riding crop. And so when people are, 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 are doing the stereotype of the director, what they're really doing is Mr. DeMille. Anyway, that's his riding crop. 
um, as we go on through this actually it's a this wine cellar. bottle of booze from his private stock of his yeah. wine cellar. I'm sorry, uh, I have a lot of those. Is, is that any good? No. Did, did you dare drink it? No. I wouldn't. <laughs> is it wine? I don't know what it is. No, it's whiskey. Now it's salad dressing. Yeah, exactly. Now it's salad dressing. So, <laughs> if that. That's true. Anyway, uh, so the rest of the room, of course, is uh, is things of the era. Oh, there's one thing, this little teepee. No one seems to know what it represents. All we do know is that it was, as far back as the 1920s, always one of the little mementos that, uh, that DeMille carried on his desk. So we do right. not know what it meant. We don't know what it was from, but uh, certainly it's uh, uh, well, you know it's a piece of. Related. And do you think it's Swami related? I, we don't know. It's, yes, it's also Indian. It's not the Ten Commandments. No, well, yeah, no, no, no. We, yeah, the American Indian scene that was deleted from the Ten Commandments. <laughs> we also have this um, from Cecil B. DeMille production. We can't say that Cecil B. DeMille ever used it, but these were commonly used. The these megaphones, megaphones in order to be heard, and of course, uh, it does rather amplify the voice. It's not quite like. Um, it's not quite like today's speakers that you can crank up to plus 10 or 11, but it certainly did the job for the time, Jeez. right? He surely, he surely doesn't need one. <laughs> That's his logo, by the way, from 1927. Yes, this is his logo from his own production company. Yeah. He was basically tossed out of Paramount Pictures in 1924. He had made, uh, he had made in 1923, the Ten Commandments. The story is, you can correct it if I have any of the facts wrong, the story is, I understand it, by this time, Adolf Zucker, who had been brought into the company a bit later, had by that time become president of Paramount Pictures Incorporated, was horrified at the cost overruns that DeMille was creating. I do not remember the exact, um, uh, the exact figure on what it cost to make the Ten Commandments, but suffice to say that nothing had cost that much at that point in movie making. Uh, at that point, after the film was finished, but before it goes into the theaters, DeMille is summarily fired from the company. He's gone. The movie stays with Paramount. The movie makes back two, three, four times what they put into it. And for years, they tried to get DeMille, you know, it's like, well, sorry, we fired you last month, but it made a lot of money this month, so when you come back. Um, essentially, my understanding is he's, he's, his... Uh, answer was to use it in, in more contemporary fashion, screw you, <laughs> formed his own production company, which uh, he moved into. You might be familiar with the David Selznick Studios, the beautiful Southern Plantation, if you've ever studied. Uh, hopefully, while you're here, you will see the studio. It's a, a block from MGM. Right. Uh, that was actually um, started off as the Thomas Ince studio. You might or might not know the name Thomas City. Ince. Yeah. In Culver City, very close to here. We haven't been down here yet. Okay, so you'll go down there and you'll see. Anyway, okay. uh, the, um, Thomas Ince had just passed away. His wife sold the studio in 1924 to Cecil B. DeMille. Cecil B. DeMille has his own production company, and it's Cecil B. DeMille Productions on this until about 1931. The Depression knocked the stuffings out of a lot of companies, including Cecil B. DeMille. So in the early 1930s, he goes back to Paramount. They're glad to have him, very glad to have him. They had been sorry they had let him go ever since 1924, and he stayed with Paramount the rest of his life. Hmm. Wow. Did I miss um, any facts on that? But, but, no, what, what, what you're doing is giving a general overview. There's a lot of detail. In oh, there's way too. But we don't need to. There's hours of detail that we could go into. But what <laughs> did, did, did I did I miss the film? What what was the film that made back three times the amount that was? The Ten Commandments. That's what it was. The first version. The, of the first Ten version, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. They went right. Away. And he had dreamed. Now he had dreamed ever since he made the Ten Commandments. Um, maybe not since he made the Ten Commandments, but one once talking pictures happened. He dreamed of redoing it with sound, with talking. Yeah, he always did. Then color happened, and he dreamed of doing it with right. talking 
and color, and then widescreen happened, and he dreamed of doing that, and in 1956, he got his wish. Yes. He made his last film, which was a remake of the original Ten Commandments, yeah. but with dialogue, and with color, yes. and with widescreen, yeah. and being able to shoot it on the real, in Egypt, yeah. and so, um, and so, he was able, his last film, his last film triumph, was the fruition of everything he would have loved to have put into his first Ten Commandments. That's, isn't that a, a fantastic? Mm -hmm. And of course, Elmer, Elmer later. Bernstein's and 30 years later. music was just uh, icing on the cake, wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. None of which would, well, of course, they would have had live orchestral music uh, with the Ten Commandments until you got to Little Towns, where you would have had a rinky-tink piano yeah. playing the same score, but yes. But the, um, the other thing now, this is true, isn't it? The, the, the Cecil B. DeMille desk was given to Elmer Bernstein, wasn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Not given, purchased. Oh, oh, he bought it from him? Yeah, no, he had several oh. desks. This was his main desk in his, in his office, in his home. <clears throat> you know how Elmer came to do that movie? He, they asked Victor Young, and Victor Young was died. Yes. And Elmer had been asked by Victor Young to do some of the uh, uh, more traditional music, the ethnic music, you know, for the dancing and the tambourines and all right, this. Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, Victor Young was not well enough to do it. He, you know, said Elmer. Uh -huh. you know, and, and he recommended Elmer. Elmer. Met Demilla and, you know, all the way went. Mm -hmm. Ethnic by way of Hollywood. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, right, right, right. <laughs> These, uh, the, the, some of this furniture, this desk and this cabinet here, and that over there came from Paramount. Right. The Paramount Prop Department yeah. was very generous when uh, this museum first opened. Mm -hmm. But this stuff goes back to the 20s. Sure. This was the last been at Paramount. This building was on the Paramount? Line? Oh, yeah. Tell For many years. The building, building actually the starts. Let's go out into the, into the front room and yeah. the way to start, where we actually start the story. Let's start here. Okay. Yeah, let's start here. Okay. Our story really starts. 